All right, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is Monday and it will be a solo episode. And I want to tell you this right now. Thank you so much for taking the uh, ride on all the solo episodes lately. I've been enjoying doing them and getting a lot of positive feedback, which is very cool. Sitting down, just shooting the shit about life. And uh, I'm glad you dig it. I'm glad you're here. It is, what's the date today? The 10th, April 10th? Yeah, April. No idea what month it is. No idea what's going on. (laughs) Just all kinds of frazzle. This episode's brought to you by my incredible sponsor, the clothing gurus themselves, uh, the great, great Standard and Strange Standard and Strange is a one-stop, incredible shop for denim, leather, boots, and good vibes. That's the uh, that's the honest truth right there. You can go to uh, Oakland, you can go to New York, or you can go to New Mexico, or you can go to their website, standardandstrange.com, and visit them on Instagram, loaded with the good stuff. They got real McCoy, Momotaro denim, just fantastic clothing. A lot of people uh, always ask me, where'd you get that? Where'd you get this? Where'd you get that? It's always from Standard and Strange, guaranteed. That's pretty much where I get all my stuff. Standardandstrange.com. Also, uh, Migos Dog. Migos Dog. I've been feeding Gertie the cleanest dog food I could find. I want her to be around forever. Migos Dog dot com constantly running specials so sign up for your uh, email and have them send you all kinds of uh information on how to get me ghost dog.com you get it's la they deliver it ear itches look at that ah, my ear itches <laughs> they deliver to your house now if you live in los angeles or you can go to air one or healthy spot pick up Migos dog, human grade, made in Malibu, California. They got salmon, duck, beef. Beef just came out. Gertie loves the beef. And they have a puppy mix. You're going to love it. Migos dog. You want your dog to be around forever. So don't skip out on good stuff for your dog. Skip out on you. You eat at 7-Eleven and let your dog eat the caviar. MigosDog.com. Anyway, here we are. It's Monday. I'm pretty fucking fried. Um, Speaking of Standard and Strange, I missed the uh, Epic Inspiration event this year. It was Friday, and I was in Vegas. We'll get to that in a minute. I was in Vegas doing 14 shows. But every year for years, I'd go to this event that Ren Tanaka put on. He is a... uh, King of all things vintage and uh, high quality Japanese goods. Rin Tanaka has a bunch of killer books out on clothing and leather jackets and Americana stuff like choppers. And he's just a, a full passionate dude into only the greatest stuff and the history of it. So... For years, he put on this show in L.A. called Inspiration, and it started out uh, in Santa Monica at this airport hangar, uh, airplane hangar, and it was just one of the most incredible events I'd ever gone to. And then it moved to downtown to this place called The Reef, and it was pretty good there. It was a weird layout. It was kind of like, you know rubik's cube or something you kind of had to spin around in there to find out you know where stuff was it it was a weird layout but always incredible group of people there everybody from like good art and the real mccoys to uh west co boots and uh, lewis leathers just all this stuff and and basically what was cool about it was you were just around other clothing nerds. Kevin and I would go, Kevin Christie, and we'd just lose our minds and hang out and 
and have some good laughs. I've had some great memories from inspiration. It was really something I looked forward to every year. And they did it at the Reef for a few years. And then they moved it to um, the convention center, kind of next to the Staples Center. And that thing just sucked. And that's just the honest truth. It went from something that was just mighty and incredible to just just really bad. And I don't know what happened. It had to be a combination of people just not having the money to set up a booth and come out to LA anymore with a combo of the, the venue just wasn't cool. And I don't know, there wasn't really a lot of uh, advertising. There wasn't even a lot of advertising on this. I'm in the clothing world. And I didn't even know about it till Standard and Strange told me, Jeremy and Neil, they were like, we're going to be in LA Friday. Are you around? Let's meet up for inspiration. And I was like, oh my God, I, I didn't hear nothing about it. So it it is an interesting thing. I don't know if Rin Tanaka wants to keep it kind of mellow or he just doesn't have time to advertise. I don't know. But before there used to be kind of old school posters on telephone poles. And you'd be like, inspirations, what's that? And uh, Kia from Self Edge was uh, really, uh, I think, a guy that really promoted it a lot and told people about it and got people in there. But this year it was moved to Pasadena and they always uh, coincided with the weekend of the Rose Bowl flea market, which happens, I think, once a month, which if you haven't been to that, it's one of the greatest things. A, a, a one time, I mean, I used to do it all the time, but if you've never gone to the Rose Bowl flea market, do yourself a favor, man. Get yourself some fucking sunblock, a good hat, and some New Balance sneakers, something comfortable, and head out to the Rose Bowl flea market. Buy the early pass and go in there and just lose your mind. It's in the parking lot of the Rose Bowl. When I first heard about it, I always thought it was inside the Rose Bowl. I was thinking like, oh, that's crazy. 50-yard line, just selling denim. But it's not. It's uh, all the way around the Rose Bowl in the uh, parking area and the the concessions area of the Rose Bowl. So if you've never been to the Rose Bowl flea market, which I think it's time for me to go again, I'll have to fire it up with uh, Kevin and head over there because it's been a long time since I, I went. And I bet it was really booming during COVID because that's a kind of an outdoor event to do. Anyway, Inspirations obviously skipped a couple of years because of COVID. And here it was back at Pasadena. And I didn't get to see it. So what a fucking bummer. I don't know if it was any good. I don't want this show to go away. And I hope that uh, I hope that it kicked ass. I don't know. I'll get a report on it from those guys and let you know. But uh, I missed it. I miss a lot of stuff because of comedy. And I'm all right with it. I'm all right with it because I love to do comedy. I've said it a million times. So work comes first. People are like, you're going to go see such and such. You're going to do this. I don't know. Let me see if I've got any uh, stand up dates first. And if I do, I won't be going. Perfect example. Every time I go to Las Vegas, I don't get to do anything because I do 14 shows at the cellar, which is totally fine because that's why I'm there. And I'm always there trying to work on some new material. And this time Muse was playing. And I love Muse. I've seen him a couple times. One time at the LA Coliseum with Rage Against the Machine and Lauren Hill, me and Ian, Ian Edwards went and uh, Andrew Thimelis. We went out there and watched uh, one of the greatest concerts I've ever seen in Los Angeles at the Coliseum where the Raiders used to play and where Evil Knievel did that iconic jump. If you've never seen that Evil Knievel jump, do yourself a favor and YouTube Evil Knievel, L.A. Coliseum. Unreal. He starts from the very top of the Coliseum. I mean, way the fuck up there. Comes down this ramp. 
just going 100 miles an hour. Scary as fuck. Just to be up there on your motorcycle and come down is scary. And then to jump, crazy. Anyway, I saw Muse there, Rage. It was technically still Rage's last show ever in Los Angeles. And up until that last tour, the short run they did, it was their last show ever. And I didn't think I'd ever see Rage. I still haven't seen him because of uh, Zach's uh, leg injury. But I didn't get to see Muse. And uh, I heard it was fantastic. I heard they're killing it on this tour. This is a fucking monster band that doesn't seem to get a lot of chatter in the world, but easily sells out all arenas. They sold out the uh, crypto crypto arena, whatever. It's fucking crypto.com arena or whatever. That's the old staples. People just call it the staples. They never... Call it crypto. I asked the guy, I go, where'd you play? And he goes, uh, Staples. <laughs> it's like Candlestick in, in San Francisco. Candlestick Park was Candlestick the entire history of it, no matter what they tried to call it. It was the stick. Dude, I'm going out to the stick. I missed the stick. He uh, saw the stones there. Rolling Stones. Tattoo U Tour, 1981. George Thorga, Jay Giles, Rolling Stones, Tattoo U. One of the great Rolling Stones tour, the Tattoo U Tour. Just unreal. Um, and that's another thing. Pac Bell, when they open that up, I, I think it's uh, called AT&T now, or, or I don't know. But where the Giants play now. It was Pac Bell, and it's always going to be Pac Bell with me. So, fuck all your names. It's so funny these people pay billions of dollars to, you know, hang their new uh, name on the place, and no one calls it that. That <laughs> waste of money. You're better off saving your money and flying one of those fucking airplanes over every game with a with a banner on the back, just saying. Hey, you're sitting in Qualcomm Stadium. <laughs> Even if you didn't name it, you could just you could just fly the plane over the stadium and act like you did name that. People would be like, "Oh, is this Qualcomm now?" I fuck, I had no idea. Oh yeah. Or you could get one of those fucking plane riders, you know, that goes up there. Will you marry me? Bullshit. Or in some people's uh, insane minds. They're, they're spraying us with chemtrails. I don't think so. It just says, will you marry me, Mike? No, nah, that's a chemtrail, man. That's got COVID part four. This is bullshit. <laughs> anyway, the Muse played in Vegas while I was there. And I didn't get to see him, but I did get to hang out with Dominic, the drummer. And... uh we went out to dream racing whenever, 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 whenever I'm in Las Vegas, I like to go out to dream racing. Um, thank you so much, Steve Jones, not from the Sex Pistols, another Steve Jones, a good friend of mine who I met years back. Uh, he runs the place or he does the, uh, something there. And I remember I had the owner on the podcast who was a F1 champion from years ago. So I like to go out to dream racing and, you know, it is uh, a perfect name. You go out there, they just have every car you've ever wanted to drive. I've talked about it over and over and over, but I can't ever stop talking about it because if you just have a little bit of money and you're in Vegas, don't gamble. Don't throw your money away on gambling. Do other shit like Dream Racing or the Pinball Hall of Fame. Dream Racing, man, I finally got to drive a 2023 Porsche 911 Turbo. Now, I was never a turbo guy. There's a couple things I don't like about turbo cars. First, I like old school, naturally aspirated. Google that. 
my friends, naturally aspirated. Right now, I feel naturally aspirated. I'm drinking a little fucking green tea. Hold on here. Mm. Uh, I like naturally aspirated cars. I do like turbo cars. There was things I don't like about turbo all my life. It's a thing called turbo lag, where you press the gas, and it kind of goes like, but there's no immediate fucking thrust. So I never like turbo lag. And the other thing, and by the way, they've gotten rid of turbo lag. And I'll get into that in a second here. But the other thing I don't like about the Porsche 911 turbo is over the back wheel wells is a vent that kind of cuts into the beautiful shoulders of a Porsche 911 that, that, now, you don't see it in the back end. The back end of the new 992 is unreal. It's just a fat ass. It's just the straight up Jennifer Lopez car. And you don't notice it. But when you're looking at the side of the car, there's a port hole. And it kind of cuts into the fucking badass shoulder stance of the 911. I never liked it. I still don't like it. That's why I like the last of the naturally aspirated Porsches, the GT3, especially the Touring. But that being said, I drove the turbo car. And you know what I say is you don't see those fucking vents when you're driving it. So who cares? You only see it when you walk up. And the handling and the power... And the insanity of this car, I finally have gotten rid of my problems with that vent. It doesn't bother me now because the car is so fucking superior. I do wish they could figure out a way to put those induction vents somewhere else somehow, like on the front of the car or or somewhere. And 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 get it back to that clean fucking body look, man. That Porsche, that Porsche look, just looking down the side, just beautiful, you know. But I drove the 2003, 2003, 2023, 911. It was charcoal color, which was beautiful, actually. Really looked good. The seats were unbelievable. I'm sitting inside this car. It was so comfortable and everything's laid out perfect. The 992, I think, is my favorite new 911 ever made from the last 20 years, hands down. Other than a vintage 911, say a 964 or the 911T, other than those cars, this is it for me. They have fucking knocked it out of the park with the looks, the power, the handling, and the comfort. This turbo is the ultimate daily driving Porsche. I immediately texted Bird. I said, I just drove the best car I've ever, ever driven in my life. It was unreal. And uh, I'll post up some video of it later today of me driving it. I mean, I was just flicking this thing around the track. Just, I I could feel the soul in it. Now, uh, it's it's paddle shift. That's another thing. People go, oh, I only go six speed manual. And now that I'm fucking 57, I'm wondering if I did have money to buy one of these cars, would I go manual or would I stick to the paddle? Because... The paddle is so fucking good now. As I got into turns, you're coming into the turn, you downshift, bam, with you know, just flicking it with your pinkies. I, I figured it out. Pinkies, pinky shifted, man, on the Porsche because the, the only thing that's bad on the Porsche is the blinkers and the windshield wipers are too close to the paddle shift. So every time you grab it, you fucking grab the uh, windshield wipers and you're going into a turn doing 95, 100 miles an hour and your windshield wipers going. But I finally figured out how to uh, stop doing that. I just flick with the pinky. 
I did a little pinky flick, you know, kind of like when you got that fucking annoying booger on the end, and you just fuck it flicking. Yeah, get out of here. Uh, get out of here. <laughs> Boogers are weird, man. Boogers are weird. What is that? It's dirt, right? It's dirt that goes in your nose, and there's something in your nose that kind of captures it so dirt doesn't go up to your skull and your brain. That's what it is. That's what boogers are, right? I don't know. <laughs> booger talk on oh, let there be booger talk. So I drove the nine, uh, the 911, and then I got to drive the new Ferrari F8. And I absolutely love Ferrari. I've never been a Lamborghini guy. I've gone over it many times on here. I, I do like Lamborghini. I like the history and everything. But if I had the money and they said Lamborghini or Porsche or Ferrari, first I'm going uh, Porsche. And second, I'd go Ferrari. And I love the history of Ferrari. But I realized with Ferrari, it's way different than Porsche because Porsche with the 911, they always have the same body, that 911. The entire history of Porsche, other than the 356, is that fucking body. And with Ferrari, there's eras that I love. The Dino is unreal. The Dino Ferrari is so fucking beautiful. And that 308, the uh, Magnum PI Ferrari, I love that one. I love the Magnum PI Ferrari, especially in any color other than red like black or this gold one I saw at the comedy store one time, you know, uh, I saw a light blue one. I saw like a B five blue looking one, like a, a Mopar colored fucking 308. Anyway. So I drove the F eight right after I drove the nine eleven. Now, if you go to dream racing and you have some extra money, try to drive two cars. Cause that really lets you know, the difference of these companies, it's crazy, you know? So I drove this unbelievable zillion-dollar Ferrari F8, and it was great, but it just didn't feel like the 911 to me. The 911 felt like I was part of the car. When the F8 felt um, a little bit boatish. It's kind of a big car. You know, those big, wide body looking Ferraris. And uh, and the braking was so fucking different on the Ferrari. You had to like hammer the brake. And I think they do that for a nice analog feel, you know, so you're not uh, you, you're you're not just tapping it and locking them up because, man, it has the biggest brake calipers I've ever seen in the biggest rotor man it looks like a giant fucking flying saucer inside your rim so i drove that and it was great and uh and dominic drove the race cars they have race cars there they have actual ferrari and audi and porsche race cars the one with the roll cage and and it's like a, a track car it's, it's not like a, a i like to drive the cars that potentially one day you might buy if you Win the lottery. Rest in peace, mom. That's for you, mom. When I win the lottery, the lottery. Doing the Axl Rose on the lottery. When I win the lottery, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I won the lottery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won the lottery. I'm out of my mind this morning. Fucking crazy. I uh, drove back last night, I don't, you know, from Vegas. You can't drive from Vegas during the day. I usually fly to Vegas, but I like to bring Gertie and I bring merch when I go to Vegas. I'm not a big slinging merch at the gig guy. I still feel weird doing that, selling merch at a gig. Uh, as much as I like doing it to get some extra money, it really helps. It just feels dirty to me. And it's just weird. Like you just, you know, tell, first of all, if you bombed, you're not going to go out there and sell merch. Can you imagine? Hey, I know I uh, just sucked in there, but can you help me out and buy a fucking hoodie? You know, it feels weird to sell merch 
but I got to do it. I'm at that level where I don't make enough money from the weekend of doing comedy. It's getting so expensive out there um, that I like to bring merch to the gigs I drive to. And people enjoy buying it, actually, because I find that, you know, I have all this merch on my website and people, it's just out of sight or out of mind or they just don't want to buy it unless it's from you. I get all of that. I get that. If you're like, uh, this is a, a, a few minutes I can talk to you and and let you know face to face that I'm buying this and supporting you. I get it. That's cool, too. But man, does it feel fucking weird selling it. There was a time it was right. It kind of ended right around when I started comedy, but the headliner would bring a feature out and he'd make the feature sell fucking merch. That's just dirty. I remember a couple of comics asked me to do that. And I was like, nah, I'm not selling your merch, dude. You know, and I didn't open for those guys ever again, which is fine with me. I'm not out there selling your merch. I'm not your fucking boy. You know, you're, you're employee. I mean, yeah, you brought me to feature and technically I am kind of working for you, but I'm not selling your fucking merch. And I would never ask a comedian to sell my merch. You know, some comedians want to help. Sometimes they're like, dude, I'll help you sell merch or whatever. It's still, I'm like, nah, dude, it's just fucking, you know, enjoy the ride. It's, uh, it's dirty. That's a dirty old school uh, comedy world trick. Just have a, oh, after you sell my merch, uh, go down the street and get me uh, in and out burger. All right. And uh, pick up some, uh, pick up some cigarettes for me too. Just fucking, yeah, gross. Anyway, it feels weird selling the merch, but I got to do it. And I, I don't mind. I love selling merch on my website. And um, I love, uh, I wouldn't mind hiring somebody later on, like an assistant. If I got to a level, I would just say, you sell the merch and take the pictures and, uh, you know, like a tour manager type of assistant. That's a different thing. That's not a comedian on the show. That is a employee of yours hired to sell shirts, maybe do some uh, video and photos and all that stuff. That's a, that's a total different game. But I do love selling the merch. I love creating the merch. I love collaborating with people on merch. I love fashion. I love clothing. I try to get the best quality stuff. My shit's more money than most people. Because I don't go to those shitty print on demand people. I actually hire silk screeners and artists to do the work and come up with my ideas. Silk screen, um, what are they called? I use these guys, silk, and you should hit them up. I want to give them a shout out because they're just so fucking great. And they, the quality of stuff, uh, silk screen printing. Hit them up. Phone number is 530-715-0299. This is not an ad. I just think that these guys are some of the greatest, um, you know, printers, shirt printers I've ever seen. They're absolutely a dream company. And they come up with all of my wacky ideas, including uh, the latest coming out. Uh, the tree hoodies will be coming out. I've got the tree hat. The tree hat has been uh, selling pretty damn good. I've uh, wanted to, uh, you know, have a clothing line. I came up with the idea during COVID being out in Joshua Tree. I look at it as like something I could uh, build. It's part of my brand, you know, dude, I got, you know, it's part of my brand. It's who I am. <laughs> all of those terms are kind of uh you know cliche and thrown around and everything but it really is part of who i am uh coming up with uh fun cool merchandise over the years i feel like i've had some of the uh funnest coolest type of uh comedy shirts and i'll see people show up at gigs in them and i'm just so proud i'll look at it like the old marshall head one that was just dean del rey or 
or the uh, the uh, Cabbage Patch one or the Grail art and working with Draplin on the, the Gertie hoodies. Gertie is, uh, I do a Gertie joke now. So the Gertie hoodies make sense before I would have the Gertie hoodies at the show and people are like, well, why do you got a hoodie of this dog? <laughs> if they didn't know about Gertie, but now Gertie's been around a few years coming up on her, by the way, seventh birthday. Gertie's going to be seven May 30th. Hi, huh, Gertie. She's under the blanket out cold. And, um, you know, so Draplin and I came up with some great ideas. Draplin is just Aaron Draplin is one of the fucking greatest and wackiest guys I've ever uh, ever uh, come in contact with and become friends with. If you didn't hear the Aaron Draplin episode, go back and listen to it. He is just a, a fucking. This guy is so good at what he does, graphic design. He is beyond. I I feel like I've put together this amazing dream team and I'm just waiting to blow up. And when I do blow up, it's going to be like, okay, I've got the the printers. I've got Draplin. I've got uh, Perry Shaw. I have Marcus Price, the incredible photographer and videographer and uh, director. I've got Troy Conrad's, one of the best photographers on the planet. Liz Vig. I've got all these people to help with the vision. I just got to keep pushing and keep pushing. It gets tough sometimes. I've said it over and over, man. It gets really fucking tough. Lately, I've just been, uh, I'm just in a spin out, man. And I'm just being honest with it. Lost my mom. You guys know that. And it's still, it's still fucking with me. And my career, I'm constantly trying to get another level up that's always fucking with me and it's not all good and i just admit it and just be honest about it it's definitely not all good there's uh people that have passed me up that started uh after me and uh you know you can't you can't blame uh things there was a while where i was like well it's ageist and it's this and it's that. I don't have a manager. It, it It's not. It's it's uh, either you kind of stick with uh, people or you don't. and uh, Or you do, but it takes a long time. And Bill Burr has been such an inspiration to me because he, he was in the game for years. No one knew who this guy was except for, you know, he had a good friend pack. You know, being on the Chappelle show and uh, had good friends around Keith Robinson and Patrice and, and uh, you know, he had a, he had a good squad. You got to have a good squad around you. I, I'm definitely not one of those people that are, are part of uh, this click or that click. I started later in life, so I'm not with the young guys and, and the guys that I do hang out with are giant famous now. So they're busy with families and careers. So I'm out there and I'm just trying to just trying to navigate my way through the uh, depression and the time bombs and the ups and the downs. There's a lot of ups. I am not here complaining, but it, uh, it, it's definitely really, really tough right now. And I'm, I'm, I'm handling it, but uh you know, you de- you dealing with a lot of emotions when you lose your last family member, your mom, your fucking mom, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's uh, it's crazy. And uh, I try not to talk about it too much on the podcast because uh, oh, here he goes with his mom. But hey, man, that's fucking that's what it is, man. That's what's going on with me. And and once a week, I kind of like to throw it out there and let people know it, 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 you know, a lot of people look shiny on their Instagrams, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all a facade. A lot of times it's tough. Social media is fucking tough. It'll eat you up. You know, people are fucking crazy out there. I put that video up last week where I was talking about how the people stole the music and 
you know, I only got like four or five negative comments on it. And it's so funny that people think they know what the fuck they're talking about when they're not even in the business. They're over there just mowing lawns going, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And I didn't uh, accuse anybody. And I think that if you took that wrong, if you took that wrong about stealing music, you definitely stole music. And you're one of those people that are like, uh, nah, I, I, I didn't do anything wrong. If you didn't steal music, you'd be like, yeah, man, he must have something to uh, say here. And look, that's not the only problem with the industry. I get it. That's one of the main things that started. People you know, bring up dumb stuff, like one particular thing, like, well, the Eagles started charging $100 before and they sold a lot of records you can't you can't talk about old record sales and i'm not going to bring this up every episode you know because i don't want to be that guy but i just wanted to throw this out real quick people could sell millions and millions of records from the past life still costs money and their accounts start to drain even no matter how rich you are you got divorces shit happens People sue you, managers rip you off, record companies rip you off, fans rip you off, uh, you know, uh, uh, venues rip you off, uh, ticket agencies rip you off. Uh, It's fucking crazy. So you've got to constantly make money. And um, so you can't say, well, those guys sold a zillion records and they're still charging a lot for their tickets. I just saw the who. The WHO said that they will never tour the U.S. And that's what they said in 1982, by the way. They said that was their farewell tour. They were the people, the WHO invented the farewell tour. The WHO on the Eminence Front uh, tour, I saw it. The WHO, um, The Clash, and T-Bone Burnett, Oakland Coliseum. Great fucking show. Kenny Jones on drums, of course. No Keith Moon. But the Clash out there destroying on the Rock the Casbah tour and uh, kind of coming to the end of the Clash. But the Who said that they will not be able to tour America anymore because what a lot of people don't know is no insurance companies will insure you now. Used to go out on tour and they would insure the band in case they missed a show. You know, a guy fucking breaks a finger or, uh, you know, somebody gets violently ill from food poisoning, they can't play, they'll ensure the tour and cover the losses of one or two shows. But since COVID, they, nobody will ensure a tour anymore. So what, um, what uh, Daltrey said was they won't tour the U.S. anymore because just to start the tour, just to start the tour, It costs $600,000 to a million dollars just to start it up. That means rehearsals, hiring the crew, and uh, getting the tour buses, getting the hotels just to start it, $600,000 to a million. So to recoup that, they need to play at least six shows on the tour, and now they've recouped and they can start making some money. But if they're only doing a 12-day tour of the U.S., like he's talking about, If they get out there and somebody gets COVID, like a bunch of guys on the tour, and they have to shut it down for three days, now they've completely lost money because they needed to play six shows to recoup the starting price of the tour. And then they would start making money. But if they have to shut the tour down, there it is. So it's going to be really weird. And I know a lot of bands out there, I'm sure they're getting COVID and they're just playing through it now. They're like, nah, we're, I mean, that's how you did it in the old days. You just got the flu and you just played. Sometimes you might've saw Led Zeppelin in Cincinnati in 1977. God, they were terrible. And little did you know that maybe Jimmy was dope sick or, uh, or John Paul Jones fucking got food poisoning or Robert Plant just, you know, th- voice was gone. And then you just played through it. Like a fuck, as Joey Diaz would say, like a, like a soldier, like a doctor. Ah. 
So uh, that's the last I'm going to bring it up because, um, it, you know, it's interesting how people just go crazy. And I will tell you this, and I'll tell you this, uh, this felt great. I released that video of me clowning on the music stealing. And there were key people that uh, liked and thumbs up and said, fuck you out of this. And they were artists that I high, I hold at the highest level. Brent Hines from Mastodon, thumbs up to it. Uh, Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine, thumbs up to it, you know. Um, and, and a few others. There was a, a bunch on there. Um, uh, Davey, Eagles of Death Metal, Dave Ketching, uh, Greg Dooley. Guys out there that are like, yeah, man, this is one of the problems, you know? And I will tell you this. Uh, I was I had a conversation with uh, Brad when we were out in the desert, and it was uh I had heard um I had heard Tom Morello on uh on Sirius XM. He's on every channel now, Tom Morello. <laughs> it's like, hey, how about a radio show? Sorry, man. We uh hired Tom Morello to do all our channels. <laughs> good. Fucking good for him, man. Good for him. Goody's over here snoring like crazy. But uh, he was talking about how, uh, you know, there were venues that uh, were, you know, uh, asked for vaccine cards to get in. And they were saying that Rage Against the Machine was the ones that were making us do the... Uh, Vaccine cards, Mr. Rage Against the Machine are now the machine. I'm not, and you know what? Like I said, I'm not going to bring any of this up anymore. I always say promote what's great, not what you hate, because I can see how fast you can spiral in to this, uh, this fucking negative energy. And next thing you know, you're in that. And I can see how much the internet and the algorithms love negative energy because that video I posted up got shit loads of views. And, you know, they always say, man, you need to engage with these people and fight with them. And then you'll get like a million views. And I'm like, there's nothing more fucking dirty and garbage than engaging with somebody you don't give a fuck about and don't know. And and hoping to get likes and views. That's disgusting. That is disgusting to me. Like, oh, yeah, man. I'm a fucking, I'm going to show these guys. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't give a fuck who you voted for, man. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it fucking uh, positive. And maybe I'll be one of the first dudes to make it who was who had positive energy. Shout out to uh, Brody Stevens. Maybe I'll be on the top and I'll be like, this one's for Brody. This one's for you, Brody Stevens. Positive energy. Push and believe. <laughs> oh, man. That was a fucking uh, a rifling of, uh, of words coming out of my mouth. That, that shit is crazy. Uh, let me let me look at my notes here because uh, lots of stuff to cover, lots of stuff to cover. Oh man, talk about negative energy. Let's get into this a little bit. You saw the Mick Mars uh, Motley Crew battle, and uh, I'm not going to pick sides, and I'm not look. Like, Nikki Six is a great friend of mine, and I'm not going to. Uh, Try to even, even for an inkling, act like I know what is going on in that camp. Not even for a minute, because I've been in bands. And if you look at all the stuff out there right now of uh, Motley Crue and who else was going crazy? Oh, I just saw that um, Nick Mason is talking about maybe playing with Roger Waters again. And after he called him an anti-Semitic and, and him and, and Gilmore, like, fuck that guy and shit. And, uh, of course, the, the battles 
of all the other bands over the years that you've seen, the Van Halen battles and all these battles. I'll tell you this right now. Bands should only be together until they make their first couple million dollars. And after that, it should be by law, no more, no more, because it's all going to be fucking grim after that, especially in this world of, uh, you know, reunions and bringing guys back and getting this shit so they can get the big money and I'm cool. You know, you didn't make money back in the day. Get out there, but it's going to get dirty. And I will tell you this right now. All bands suck. (laughs) It's just the, it's just the truth. When you get to a certain, a long era, you're like, I hate this guy. I don't know any bands really where all of them, uh, maybe you too, maybe you too still love each other. I don't know. Like I said, I, I I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, but I will tell you, are you still friends with the guys you went to high school with? I am friends with a couple of those guys and the rest, I don't even know what the fuck they're doing. Or you had some kind of blowout with them on Facebook 10 years ago and you never talked to them. Now throw uh, like 50 to $100 million into that friendship and let's see, uh, let's see what happens. Let's let's see what happens out there, huh? Let, let's uh, let's throw the money in a ring and watch each other just punch each other out. <laughs> that would be great. That's what we need. We need a new like fuck the UFC. The UFC is boring now. These are skilled fighters trained beating each other up. Yeah, we've seen that. Let's get some bands. Let's get like uh, okay, Mick Mars can't fight. Of course, because he's, you know, he's got the fucking, he's got the uh, cement bones. He's got that disease. But let's get like, uh, let's get like Vince Neal and and throw the money in the middle and then get like uh, uh, Mick Mars's lawyers and just let's see them fight it out. Let's see these people fight. That's what I want to see. Actual, let's see Roger Waters and Gilmore fight. Just fucking bare knuckle, no gloves, just old school in the ring. And the winner gets the song publishing and the fucking band name. Winner gets the band name and the song publishing. Fuck that. I mean, those fuckers are going to fight. Couple of 70 year old granddads. You fucking. Rah! <laughs> Even Kiss, Kiss having the battles. Uh, Ace coming out saying, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop the secrets. I'm gonna reveal the secrets of you fuckers if you don't apologize." What, what, what kind of fucking, what kind of uh, third grade shit is that? If you don't apologize, I'm gonna drop your secrets. Yeah, yeah, that's so fucking pussy. That's the thing, man. That is the thing. The internet has made everybody tough. You know, everybody thinks they're a badass on the internet. And it's so funny. He's a Paul Stanley called me and told me to fuck off. I was going to drop the secrets, but my AA said, man, be a bigger man. Be a bigger man about it, dude. You know, just walk away. Oh, man. It's so fucked, too, because I love all these guys. You know, some of them are are my friends. And you're just like, damn. Damn, the Motley Crew, just fucking, uh, you know, it's it's a rough world. I'll tell you this: I want to give a shout out to Gene Simmons, um, and and I will tell you this right now: people shit on Gene Simmons for years. The guy is a goddamn genius. I love him, and uh, he figured out the business and did it right. Make all the money you can. So you you can fucking relax. (laughs) I went to the uh, Gene Simmons Museum at the Rio Hotel and saw the collection in person. And it is so insane to see this kiss behemoth. 
you know, they say, yeah, kiss, uh, you know, I love this thing. Uh, we got condoms and we got coffins. So we'll get you coming and we'll get you going. That's a fucking funny thing to me. You know, it's a funny, cool gene, throwaway dad joke. But this man is absolutely a genius for all the stuff that they had. And I'm telling you, at 57 years old, I looked in those cases and still wanted all the stuff that was in those cases from the 70s. The old Kiss tattoos, the Viewmasters, the Kiss dolls, the Kiss pinball, the Kiss 8 millimeter concert kind of viewer, the belt buckles. The kiss everything, man. It was just, I mean, you know, I, I know he got it from the Beatles, you know, the Beatlemania. And he took it and he went way, way further. And he he really um, pioneered merchandising and uh, licensing out your logo. Look, man, I think Kevin Hart is a, a funny guy, but I also think he's a genius for uh, having his hands in all kinds of business. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, you kind of want to, you want to be all over the place so you can have money to create stuff you want to do. Do some films, do some movies, do some documentaries. I'd still love to do that Dan the Green documentary. So, you know, you, you constantly pushing and, and you, you got to have all the irons in the fire. So, to see this Gene Simmons stuff and to really take it in. You're inside this museum in the Rio Hotel and you're walking through and you're looking at literally thousands of pieces of stuff that say kiss. And it's a uh, it's it's unbelievable. And the stuff, a lot of it is just cool shit, man. It is like really cool. I was uh, working with a comedian, Gabriel. And uh, he said, you know, they had the Kiss pinball there. And we went to the Pinball Hall of Fame. And he said, do you think there's a lot of money in their name on the machine? Or you think it's just the cool factor? And I said, well, I think it's probably a little of both. They get a, probably a licensing fee. But then it's the cool factor of having your own pinball machine. I know if I had the Dean Del Rey pinball machine, it would just be crazy. I would just make it the grail artwork. You know, the backsplash would be the grail artwork. Me walking by the shop like, whoa. And then all kinds of shit, comedy, rock and roll, motorcycles, cars on the playing field, Gertie in the middle. Get the Gertie extra ball. Gertie, quit snoring, Gertie. Gertie snoring like crazy. Anyway, uh, Gene Simmons Museum, go check it out. I wanted to go to the Punk Rock Museum in Vegas, but I didn't make it over there. It's just uh, pretty busy. But uh, I did go to the Pinball Hall of Fame again. I ran into Tim Arnold, the owner. He's the guy I had on episode 100. That was 590 episodes ago. And there he was, still in there, owner. And uh, also the fixer of the machines, Tim Arnold, still one of the most craziest wild dudes I've ever had on Let There Be Talk. And it was just so great to see him. There he is, still standing. I'm still alive. And I'm playing uh, pinball. I played the new Foo Fighters game. Foo Fighters have a pinball machine. I played the new Rush machine. Rush machine's great. Foo Fighters machine is really good. I played the um, Mandalorian machine, which I hated, which is a bummer because I love Bill and Bill's on the machine and I love the Mandalorian. I just don't like the layout of the machine. Anytime it has too much shit in the middle, ramps and everything where I can't visually see the playing field, I don't like that game because it's just too, it's a dirty playing field. I can't see it. And the best game I played, and the best game I played in a while since Metallica, Metallica was my favorite pinball for years, is the new James Bond. And the new James Bond pinball machine is so fucking great. It, you get the ball, it, uh, James Bond captures it in his, remember the one uh, James Bond, Sean Connery, where he's in the rocket thing, the, uh, you know, the... Uh, 
the people, you know, the rocket pack. I'm trying to find a name. Rocket pack. You put on the rocket pack and you kind of fly around. He flies around. Well, there's this one ramp where you shoot it up and it gets onto James Bond's rocket pack and then he flies across the playing field and then drops the ball. Oh, man. James Bond. Kenny, shout out to Club Soda Kenny. We both love James Bond and I would love to have the James Bond pinball. I asked uh, Tim Arnold, the owner, what his favorite game was. And he's like, well, I am a, uh, I am a proprietor uh, of the establishment, so I am not allowed to have an opinion. <laughs> Those are the kinds of answers you will get from Tim Arnold, owner of Pinball Hall of Fame. He is... Do yourself a favor. If you're in Vegas, you go to Dream Racing and then you go to Pinball Hall of Fame and then you go to the Punk Rock Museum and the Kiss Kiss Museum. Uh, they got the Pee Wee Golf, too, at the Kiss thing. But uh, those are some great things to do in Vegas that have nothing to do with gambling or whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> uh, great week of shows. Thank you, Comedy Cellar, for having me. And thank you to all the people that came out to the shows. I met a lot of great uh, fans. Let me get some of uh, Jason Stratton. Great. He came out, uh, thought he had a heart attack in the front row during the show. That was kind of scary, uh, but he's okay. And uh, it was great to see him. He's a new Patreoner. Roger Lewis, new Patreoner. Thank you for joining up, buddy. And uh, what else we got here? Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. I'll be doing a live Zoom tonight, Monday night, April 10th, probably around 5.30 Pacific time. If you want to join me once every couple of weeks on a live Zoom, join the Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Um, Anyway, great to see a lot of a lot of the shows were sold out. Great comedians were on the show. Dustin Urban. Uh, who else was on? Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen Dunham. She, uh, which by the way, she started comedy at 44 also, which was amazing to hear her story. Really cool. Really cool. A comedy seller. Las Vegas. Do yourself a favor. Go see comedy at the Rio in the cellar. Great fucking room. Great room. This weekend, I will be in Texas. I'll be in Austin, Texas at the Moto GP with my buddy Bill Burr. I can't thank him enough for uh, bringing me. And I want to thank uh, Jason Shinnick, CEO of Ducati, who I had on the podcast for getting us hooked up. I called him up. He said, I got you. I'm going to get to ride on the track on Saturday. I'm going to ride a uh, Ducati Penegali on the track. And it'll be the first time I've been on a motorcycle in a couple of years. So I'm excited about that. And then we're doing a show out at Texas A&M at the arena there at the college. DeanDelRay.com for your merch and all your tour dates. I got a Santa Rosa date coming up. I've got two shows in Alameda coming up. And then, of course, a bunch of shows in uh, Los Angeles over the next few weeks. Comedy Store. I uh, saw air. I saw air. The, the story of the Air Jordan. The Jordan 1 sneaker. The Jordan deal. The Nike fucking sensation. Uh, done by uh, Matt Damon. And what's the other dude? Fucking Jennifer Lopez's uh, guy. I'm fucking drawing a blank on his name right now. And he's, <clears throat> he's, uh, they did the film. And, uh, you know, they did Goodwill Honey. And these guys are fucking killers. Why am I forgetting his name? I, why am I, I'm forgetting his name right now. And while I'm doing it, you're in your car or you're at the gym and you're going, blah, blah, blah. It's blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. I want the blah. <laughs> anyway, um, I saw Air. It's fantastic. It's a great, 
great film. And I love sneakers. I love fashion. Like I said at the top of the show, and I say at all the shows, and it's just loaded with incredible 80s memories. And one of the main ones and one of the greatest games, a few of them that I had was Coleco football, the handheld football. And the Mattel football and the Mattel baseball, those plastic little games with dots that you were just obsessed with. It just it sat in your hand, Coleco football. And you, you just fucking, and they had pro and novice. And you just, you know, you could pass and you're moving the red dots. It's so crazy how simple it was back then. You move a red dot and then you you press it, get down the field, dodge it. Oh my God. So the whole movie is great, but I, I saw those those handheld Coleco and Mattel football and baseball games. And they had a basketball one too. They were just square, perfect piece of plastic. And it just, oh God, you just fucking... You get in so much trouble in school when this shit came out. People now, I can't even imagine going to school with a phone. I, I mean, I already hated school, and I would drift off in the back playing the Coleco football with my goddamn Sony Walkman on, listening to fucking Scorpions' Love Drive album. Just Scorpions in your pocket, hidden, you know, hoodie on. You got your hoodie on with your fucking headphones hidden and the teacher up there is just teaching bullshit. She doesn't want to be there. We don't want to be there. We want to be at the fucking ACDC back and black show at the cow palace, but we got to go to school, you know? So to go, you start fucking doing shit that makes it feel a little better. Like your Sony Walkman with auto reverse. Remember that auto reverse came out? You didn't have to flip the cassette anymore. Oh my God. I don't have to take the cassette out and turn it around. Oh man. Finally, that was such bullshit. Taking the cassette out and turning it around. The work that took. (laughs) Anyway, air is great. It's really good. And a couple uh, really quick. Cameos by comedians Al Madrigal and uh, Jay Moore are in there for a minute or two. Great to see. Whenever I see comedians on movies and TV, I'm not one of those guys like, why didn't I get that? I'm like, fuck yeah, cool. Maybe uh, maybe next time they'll pick me to be in something. Maybe they'll keep hiring comedians. Maybe they'll keep coming down to the store and putting us in some uh, films. Make a little fucking uh, side change and get some health care. Yeah, maybe. Maybe you stop hating. This whole episode is uh, geared around not talking about the haters again. <laughs> um, okay. What do we got here? I uh, I guess that's about it. Oh, new Metallica this week. I cannot speak of haters. Speaking of haters. That comes out this week, and you know what that means. When a new Metallica comes out, the new fucking complainers come again. I don't like the snare. I don't like the guitars. I don't like the gaga. I don't like the gaga. I don't like the gaga. Can't wait to hear the new Metallica. They're going to be on Jimmy Kimmel all this week. And then uh, they got the movie on uh, Thursday night. You can go to the movie theater. And you can see uh, all 12 videos and and hear stories about the record and everything and hear the record first at the movie theater. And then it's out, I believe, Friday. And man, what I've heard so far is just fantastic. And I can't wait to hear the whole record. Metallica has just been killing it. On the way home, I've been listening to the Metallica channel 105 on Sirius. I listened to it all last night at 2 in the morning coming home from Vegas. And man, the last three Metallica records have been so fucking good. And people just, I don't think they're talking about it enough. They're just not talking about the level of metal these guys are putting out at 60 years old. That song came on. That was just your life. It came on and then spit out the bone back to back. And I was like, this shit 
is fire, man. And those were on the last few records. And it's just amazing how great these are. Death Magnetic and, um, and, and the new record is 72 Seasons. Death Magnetic. Uh, what was the other one called? Man, my brain's not working today. And I fucking know it. Um, oh, all right. I, I refuse not to know. I, I got to look it up. I, and I think that the, the least that you look up, the more your brain will work. And come on, I'm a huge Metallica fan. I just, I'm old and I, I'm babbling stuff to you guys off the cuff. Uh, hardwire, self-destruct, death magnetic, sane anger. I know you hate sane anger. I know. Uh, they played a, a sane anger song also on the way home. Still love it. Purify. Oh, God. Sane anger is great. Fuck all y'all. Dirty window. Sane anger. Frantic. Some kind of monster. Get out of here. It's fucking great. Anyway, 72 seasons out this week. I cannot wait. It is 12 tracks. 72 seasons was the uh, latest single they put out. And, uh, oh, my God. Screaming Suicide, Alexa Turner, If Darkness Had a Sun. Just great. This record's great. I don't like the cover, and I'll admit it. And I'll say it. I don't like the album cover. It's all good. It's not my cover. It's not my band. I get to hear the music. That's fine. Great, great. Anytime we get another Metallica record at this level, they're working at this level at 60 years old. I want, I'm 60 in a few more years. I want to be like an incredible comedian at 60. I'd love to put out a death magnetic level comedy special or a 72 seasons or a, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't think I'd want to put out a. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I want to put out a uh, a level of uh, of sane anger comedy special because you guys, I would love it. You guys would be like, this guy knew he wasn't funny. Let's hit his Instagram, Dean. You need to learn to get funny. Someone wrote that yesterday on my Instagram. It's like, you, you know, I don't even get mad at bad comments. I'm more disappointed just in humans. Anytime I see stuff like that, I'm just like, uh, I, I don't care what you say to, to me. I'm just disappointed in you. You know, you're just you're like humans, just like, ah, oh, bummer. Bummer what we are right now. Anyway, I'm leaving it on a high note. I'm leaving it on a high note. What do we got here? Uh, let me, one last thing and then we're out. Gertie's still snoring. Uh, once again, hit my YouTube channel, subscribe to it and subscribe to the podcast on, uh, YouTube or, uh, iTunes, check out cactus radio network.com, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. And, um, yeah, I guess that is it. Oh, one last sponsor banker guitars. You want a custom made guitar? You like flying V's? Kirk Hammett likes flying V's. So does fucking Headfield. Get yourself a banker, Karina V or Explorer, or one of his Firebirds, or his new crazy SGs. He's got the gold top, arch top type of SG out. Unbelievable. Bankerguitar.com. Tell Matt I sent you. Get yourself on the waiting list and order yourself a custom to specs dream guitar that you want. Something that you've always wanted. Get yourself a hand-built guitar out of uh, Tennessee. And uh, Gertie is snoring like crazy. And get it, get it from Banker. Matt and his wife, unbelievable. Marcus King's out there playing them. So is Scott from Rival Sun. So is uh, Mastodon plays them. All kinds of people are playing Banker guitars. Because basically, it is like the old world of building guitars. One guy by hand, you're going to own a soul machine. His life goes into those guitars and you can own one. It'll be your guitar for life. Banker guitar. Follow him on Instagram. Tell him I sent you. I love all you. Hope to see you out at the shows. Santa Rosa, Alameda, 
Texas. I'm coming your way. Moto GP in the house. Thank you for joining me each week and enjoying the solo episodes. Please share my comedy videos on your Instagram and pass around my YouTube videos. It really helps. Candles are lit.